Good morning. Good to see you. Sunshine. And a little warmer, right? Windy, warm, sunshine, all the good reasons to try to get outside a little bit. This week especially, I guess, it's going to be even warmer. Some folks think it's baseball season. It's getting close. Still basketball. Still got a football game to, to, to deal with, too. So, Huh? No football? Okay. Uh, hopefully you grabbed your bulletin when you came in today. Take a look at all the items that are listed in there. Do your attendance on the little tear-off piece here. Make sure you take a look at that. Um, it's good to have you. Those of you that are with us on the live stream, uh, today is Communion Sunday. So if you, uh, you have a few moments to, to get the items together for the communion service that will be happening a little bit later. Um, if you're in person, hi April. If you're in person um, and you want to get one of those communion kits, go ahead and grab one of those. Uh, if you prefer to have that here today, pick it up in the back. Um, somebody can bring them to you if, if you need that as well. Speaking of online, have you missed a service or a Sunday before? D did you know you can actually watch these services at home or you can have relatives do the same if you have something going on? Even more exciting, I think, is that we have a new updated web page. There's a thing called the internet and we have websites. You familiar with that? Some folks used to think that that was just a flashing, a flash in the pan was going away. Not so, huh? But if you miss a Sunday, um, our website's been redesigned, and there's a lot of tech talent that's sitting in the back, and some audio talent. And Sarah, wave your hand, Sarah. Yes, you have to wave your hand. Say, there she goes. She doesn't like to do that, but Sarah put a lot of time and effort uh, in redesigning the website. So if you miss a Sunday, this is always recorded, and you can actually go back and listen. Or if you have a favorite, or if you want to recap something, or uh, something just you know you heard something and you want to check it out from from uh, Andre or from. Uh, from Pastor Dan or when Terrence, uh, you know, coming up, if there's something you want to catch on those, you go right ahead. Go to that website, search those, pull those up. Those are always updated by the tech staff. So if you didn't know that, uh, hopefully now you do. <clears throat> Ladies, the Mission Board and Vision Committee invite you to a baby shower for the Rantoul Crisis Pregnancy Center. That's Saturday, February 18th. So what's that, uh, two weeks from yesterday? Um, that'll be at here at the church. So bring a friend if you want and do that. Um, Andre talked about this a little bit last week when he was telling, giving his message, he talked about camp, summer camp, and some of the experiences he had there and some of the excitement. How many of you have ever been to Lake Springfield Baptist Camp? A few of you, a few of you. A few hands not up in the air. Um, if you haven't been aware of the, the Lake Springfield Baptist Camp, it's over in Lake Springfield, just south of town a little bit, actually on the lake. Uh, it's a place where many of us growing up went to. Um, many of you that have been in the church, you know that you've gone over and had retreats there. You've done service days there. There's a lot of things, that the, the history of this church and the supporting of that camp over there. Uh, I bring that up because next week, Andy Rains, who is the new camp manager for the Lake Springfield Baptist Camp, will be here. And he's going to be sharing about the ministry of the camp and the impact they have lives on children. You want to be here to hear about it. So that's now two Sundays. You're Andre talking about it. We're telling you now next week this is coming. I encourage you to, if you haven't, it's a great little road trip. It's a nice little place. They've got activities going on long, but uh, just to get away, go walk in the woods, that type of uh, activity is generally open for folks uh, who, who want to take advantage of that. So I would encourage you to do that. A lot of interesting and neat things, a lot of history in the church, a lot of excitement. And use the internet as we transition here at this point in time um, into our time of worship. Our call to worship today is from Psalms 95, and it's a wonderful message of God's love and his mercy, and he calls upon us to worship with him. Come, let us rejoice in the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us lift up our psalms and our praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He is our God. We are his people, the flock under his care. Listen to his voice today. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let's pray. Fathers, we come into your house today with the beautiful sunshine and the warming weather 
the open arms and the friendships and the smiles that exist in here today. Let us come with open hearts to your message, to your word, to recognize who you are, what you've done for us, and how you love us. That you are king above all kings and God, king above all gods. Please be present with us today. Let us feel your, your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's time for praise and worship. So the team should come. We're going to sing. If you're able and willing and interested, please stand and join and enjoy this time of song.
Jesus, we are so thankful because we are so unworthy, unworthy of the grace and the mercy and your resurrecting power, Lord God, that you have provided to us by your death on the cross and the shedding of your blood. You have indeed washed us white as snow and made us clean, not because of anything we deserve, not because of anything we do or say, only because of you, Jesus, and the power of your glorious name and your wonderful, wonderful lordship over us, Lord. We ask that you help us to surrender more deeply to your lordship today as we hear your word. Help us work hard to apply what you're giving to us, what your Holy Spirit speaks into our hearts so that we can follow you sincerely, so that we can know that, Lord God, you are our Lord and master, not just some cool dude we talk about. You are Lord and master of our lives. We ask, Jesus, you will just continue to work your mighty power in our lives, that we will glorify you and live in your abundance. And we're grateful for all these things, and we ask for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, God bless you all. You may be seated, and the ushers will come forward to take offering this morning. Let's look to God in prayer. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the great love you have for us. And it's in part because of our love for you, we give back to you these tithes and offerings as a way of saying thank you for all you've done. And a way for us also to say we not only appreciate you, God, but we, we choose to serve you. And this is a token of our love to you. We pray, God, that you take these gifts, these tithes, these offerings, and use them for the furtherance of your kingdom. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been looking at uh, Luke chapter 10 for several weeks now about the, the marching orders that Jesus gave to the 70, or, or some translations say 72 uh, followers, disciples that, that went out, uh, that Jesus sent out. Uh, the, the, the 70, 72, some there's lots of different Greek manuscripts that the Bible's based on, and some of the manuscripts say there were 70. Some say there were 72. I'm not sure it matters whether there was 70 or 72. Let's just say there was a bunch of people that Jesus sent out. And Jesus was sending out this bunch of people to, to go to the towns where he intended to go. And he had some marching orders for them for things they were supposed to be doing, approaches they were supposed to take when, when they went out to, to minister to those around them. And, and lots of things he said, stuff that like Andre said last week, and he did a great job, thank you Andre. Uh, but last week he talked about uh, go and stay in people's homes and just, just stay there with them. And, and he brought out the point that part of that, and there may have been more, but part of that was to establish relationships with people. Spend some time to get to know them, let them get to know you, invest in their lives so that you have the opportunity, not just by, by preaching the words to them, but by showing from your life what God has done for you and what God can do with them. Establishing those relationships is such, such an important part of life. Today we're going to look at another aspect from Luke chapter 10, verse 9. 
Another of the marching orders that uh, Jesus gave to his 70 or 72 followers. Uh, this one, sometimes we scratch our heads at some of those when we try to apply it to our own life and try to figure out how does this apply to me. I'm a practical kind of guy. I just really think that, uh, well, I'm just practical. That's the way I think. And when I, when I look at the, the Bible and I look at the Scripture, it's great to have the, the great theological discussions. It's great to, to talk about all of the philosophy and theology and all those kinds of things. But what I really want to know is what can I do with this? Uh, rather than talk about some strange, weird theological concept, I'd rather know just right from the basics, what can I do with it? And I hope as we're looking through the marching orders, you don't just think about the great stuff that Jesus said back then, but you, you try to look at it and say, what can I do with this in my life, in my faith? What can I do today, here and now, as I leave this place, I go back to my homes, I go to my jobs, I go to my neighborhoods, I go to my family? What can I do with this? And maybe that's part of what we could do during the, the silent prayer I often have at the end, is spend some time asking God to help clarify in, in your own heart what you can do with the message God shared with you today. So today we're going to look at a, a message that uh, Jesus had, his uh, marching orders for the disciples. As they were going out, they were not just supposed to to talk about God. They were not just supposed to talk about his kingdom, although that's part of it, but he had specific marching orders that we'll see. In Luke chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus told them, Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Or some translations say the, the kingdom of God is at hand. The last part of that we understand. You know, these 70, 72 disciples were going to the various places Jesus was about to go. And part of the, the message they had was, Jesus is coming soon. The, the kingdom of God, the, the, the presence of God in our midst, Jesus who was God in the flesh, is coming soon. That was part of their message, that the, the kingdom of God, in a spiritual way, was coming to them soon. And they had the opportunity to hear directly from Jesus his words, to hear directly from Jesus the words of God. And as they accepted Jesus, as they accepted his message, as they committed their life to him, they were, in essence, opening their lives up to God's presence, God's rule, God's kingdom in their hearts. And so, in a very literal sense, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God was coming soon. Jesus was coming in short order. And so that was part of their job was to, to tell them to get ready to experience God's presence. And I, and I think from a practical standpoint, we should be trying to get ready to experience God's presence as well. Often that's what we talk about doing when we go to church. You know, how many times have you said or been told where two or more are gathered together, what? God's there with us. God's Spirit is here. When we gather together, we are literally coming, welcoming God's presence in our midst. And so the, the message to us that the kingdom of heaven is near is coming soon. Every week when we come to church, we, we are in essence coming into the kingdom of God, into the presence of God. Now, unfortunately, and I, I've been on... I, Sorry to say on the other side of the pulpit. I'm on the other side of the pulpit right now. But there have been a lot of times when I wasn't the preacher. And I was sitting out there instead of standing up here. And when I was sitting out there, I experienced that I did not always experience God's presence when I came to church. And it wasn't because God wasn't there. I think it's because I wasn't there. Well, yeah, physically I was there, but not spiritually. Spiritually, I was still thinking about that argument we had on the way to church, or I was thinking about that frustration I had all week at the job, or I was, I was thinking about that, that person in that other car in that parking lot or out on the road or the interstate or whatever. I said all kinds of stuff going on in my mind. The, the, the 
kids had a cold or I had a cold or my parents had a cold or all these things running around in my mind and I came to church and my mind was anywhere but here at church. I was thinking about the, the Pro Bowl game that they're going to have this afternoon where they're playing flag football and trying to imagine what that's going to be like or, or trying to think about next week's Super Bowl and who's going to win. Is it going to be this team or that team and which color should I wear? Am I going to a, a Super Bowl party? And there's all these things going through our heads and oftentimes when we come to church, we don't experience God's presence. He's here, but too often we are not. And so it's a good reminder that the kingdom of heaven is near, that God's presence in here, what, what we need to do, very literally, is open our hearts, open our lives to God, to his presence, to try to set aside from, from our minds and hearts all those distractions, those things that are hammering away at you that want you to be distracted the distractions we bring, turn away from them and experience the kingdom of God because God's presence is here. And so that's always one of my prayers. We, we oftentimes, generally, Sunday morning before the service start, we gather in the sound booth and it's one of my prayers is God help us to truly experience God's presence today. So that's one of my prayers for you today, that you will realize what Jesus told to the, king, the, the disciples, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is near you now, and encourage you to experience his presence in your heart, to allow the Holy Spirit to truly touch you deep down inside. To come away moved, changed, enriched spiritually as a result of being in God's presence. Or, or better yet, as a result of God being in your presence. The kingdom of God is near. So that was one of the, the, the messages that disciples were supposed to go tell everybody. The kingdom of heaven is near you now. Jesus is coming. But the other part is one that we, on the outside, we have more trouble with. At least, at least I, I tend to have more trouble. Heal the sick. How many here would say you have the gift of healing? You haven't gone down to Carl Hospital lately and gone up and down the halls touching people and setting them free from the illness that they have, the diseases they have, so they can get out of there, not have all those expenses, not have all those stuff. There's been a lot of times I wished I had the gift of healing. You know, when, when my sons were sick and they were too young to really tell me what's going on, but they've got this super high fever and they're burning up and it's just killing my heart to see them struggling. There's nothing they could tell me, nothing they could do, and very little I could do about it except this one time when one of them had a super high temperature the doctor or nurse, I forget which, they said, don't bring him in. Just put him in an ice bath. You ever put a two-year-old in an ice bath? That look of betrayal. <laughs> I thought you loved me, Dad. Why did you dunk me inside this icy bath? It's what I had to do. I wish... I could have taken that temperature onto myself. I wish I had the, the gift of healing to say, be healed, son. Just get back to normal right now. Jesus sent the, the 72, a whole bunch of his disciples out. Gave them marching orders to, to go out in the different places he was going to go, to go with the, the message of God, to go out with God's grace and mercy, to to receive hospitality and, and the trust in God. Don't even take a change of clothes or extra money. Just, just trust in God and gave them the power, at least during that mission, to heal the sick. I say at least during that mission because we, we know 
that not, not everywhere in, in the, even the Bible times were people able to be healed, or, or did God choose? Probably better way to say, did God choose to heal them? I, I think that 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul, we don't know exactly what he had, but the Apostle Paul had what he described as uh, a... Uh, it slipped away from me. Thorn in the flesh, thank you. He had this thorn in the flesh. Well, you know the story. I don't have to tell you about it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, Apostle Paul, the, the chosen one of God who, who preached to hundreds of people, who started dozens of churches, who healed people all the time, three different times he begged the Lord to take away his thorn in the flesh. And each time God said, no. God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my own weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Sometimes God chooses not to heal the physical problem. Sometimes what God chooses, he chooses to show his power a different way. Sometimes he chooses to show his power by helping us get through the difficult times, realizing that sometimes we need that lesson of depending on God more than we need the blessing of the healing, that God provides healing in a different way, healing the inside, healing, giving us the strength, giving us the, his comfort, his compassion. Sometimes God says no to that. But there were times like uh, with the disciples, the 72 disciples, when Jesus sent them out, he gave them the special power of healing. And, and we see in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, why God gave them that power, at least for that season when they were going out and preaching and teaching. Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. We, we've got to pay attention to the truth we heard from, from the apostles, from the disciples, when they, they preached and God gave us God's message. He says, For the message God delivered through angels in the Old Testament has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of obedience was punished. Verse 3, So what makes us think, we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak, delivered to us by, by the disciples, like the 72 in, in Luke chapter 10. It says, and God confirmed the message. God confirmed the message of the 70 people, 70 disciples, by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. Jesus gave the 70 disciples the power to heal as they were proclaiming the good news of Jesus, as they were announcing his coming and his presence as a way of saying, this is the truth. This is the message of God because of the, had the power of God in their lives at that moment in time where they were able to heal People could say, wow, they've got to be speaking the truth because no one has ever been able to heal the blind or, or, or cast out leprosy or, or get rid of the, the demon possession. All these things that are impossible, God made possible when he let people know, listen to this message that my followers are giving. They are speaking from me. And I demonstrate this by putting my, my stamp of approval, my seal on their lives to say, see this power? See this miracle? That comes from me. So does the message. So part of the reason that Jesus gave that power was to, to authenticate the, the gospel message that the disciples were giving. But sometimes, sometimes, God works in a different way. Sometimes rather than giving us the ability to heal, to take away people's sickness, blindness, hearing loss, all these issues, cancer, sometimes rather than giving the ability to wipe that away, God gives us a healing of a different kind. 
If your dilemma is loss of hearing, well, you can go get a hearing aid, right? If you've got heart blockages, you, you can go get a stent or maybe a heart bypass. There's lots of things we can do to, to take care of a lot of issues. But what if your issue isn't a heart blockage? What if the problem is a broken heart? What, what if your, your struggle is with anxiety? Well, what if you're, you're fighting depression because of, of all these struggles that have been going on in your life and the finances and your family and your relationship and, and the economy and, and all of these things have just been weighing you down and your heart just feels like you're about to die? Because of all the struggles you faced. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's a loved one, a family member. We read in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 about God telling Paul, no, I'm not going to heal you. I'm going to help you get through this. That's how I'm going to provide healing. We look a little bit later in 2 Corinthians chapter, not excuse me, it's a little earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We see that God sometimes does provide us with a different kind of healing and a different gift of healing. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, he says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles, which is what he did with Paul later when he says, I'm not going to heal you. God comforts us with all our comforts so that we can do what? Comfort others. God gives us the gift of healing in our own life, the healing of our, our, our anxiety, of our depression, our our. our Loneliness, or the, the pain of loss, or whatever it is, God gives us His comfort so that we can comfort others. When those around us, when they are troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Somebody asked about this defibrillator I have up here. Most of you probably know what this is. If somebody has a a heart attack or something, their heart fails them, and you're able to get there soon enough, you, you can take this defibrillator, and actually it's pretty cool, you just punch the button and it walks you right through it. But it, it helps you put the, the pads on the different spots on their chest, and then tells you get all clear, and then you hit the button, and it gives them a zap. And, and the, the, the electric zap is pretty powerful, it's powerful enough oftentimes to restart their heart. And so this is a, a it's not just a cool thing to have. It, it, it's a lifesaver. I've actually had, uh, in other church, I've had people go down, not during the worship service, but during a, a week meeting, and there happened to be a nurse there who knew how to use it and uh, revived the woman, and she was healthy again. So that's one way that, that we can bring healing to someone, and hopefully we never have to use this in church, okay? I, I hope we never have, but it's great to have it, just in case. We can provide physical healing with a, a, a defibrillator that can restart our hearts. But we can also provide the spiritual, emotional healing. When those around us are struggling, when, when they're afraid, when they're lonely, when they have the anxiety, when they have fear, they have all of these issues in their lives that are from the inside out, breaking their heart and tearing them up. It's not a matter of getting a shock to their heart. It's a matter of giving them comfort in their heart, in their mind, in their soul. We can still provide the healing of comfort. That's something we can do Every time, as long as 
We remember what Andre said last week about establishing relationships. We establish relationships with those around us so that we have a chance to, to, to know them and they have a chance to know us. We invest in their lives so that they feel comfortable saying, yeah, this guy doesn't just see me as a project to take the church. They, they see me as a person who has needs and I, I trust this person. And as we develop those relationships, there's a, a feeling of trust so that when they have these struggles, they're able to, to open up to us. Or, or maybe we're close enough to them that if they don't talk about it, we can say, I see in your eyes there's something really going on. Would you like to talk about it? Let's go have some coffee. I'd love to just sit and listen to you. You see, that's, that's part of the trick. You don't have to go talk. Sometimes you just listen. And by being there for them, by allowing God's Spirit to, to work through you, you can be a comfort in their lives. You can provide the healing of comfort. The healing of comfort that God gives to you, has given to you as you've gone through struggles. To realize that the God who created heavens and earth, the God who said he would be here for us, actually is here for me, has been here for me. God has helped me get through this. I couldn't have done it on my own. But God gave me the ability to endure this and the comfort to have healing. Let me share with you the blessing of comfort and hope that God has shared with me. You may never be able to anoint somebody with oil, lay your hands on them and pray a physical healing. God might do that. He might not. But we have the promise that we can, as ambassadors of God, as God's messengers, we can provide his comfort, his peace, his hope to those around us. And as we think about the marching orders that God gives us, that God has given you. As you think about how you can apply this message of healing in your life this week, I hope you think about how you can be better invested in the lives around you. How you can reconnect in relationships and, and allow your heart to be opened up to the heart's the feelings of those around us so that God can provide through you his comfort to those who so desperately need it. Let's take some time in prayer. Ask God to speak to your heart and begin to show you how you can put this message into action in your life this week. And we thank you for the healing you provide to us each and every day. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for the comfort. Help us, God, to know how we can provide healing to those you have placed in our lives so that we can be your servants reaching out in love. Pray this in Jesus' name. We have the privilege this morning of having um, celebrate the Lord's Supper. I invite the deacons and Andre if you come up at this time. If we get our hearts ready, let me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The, the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Corinth and reminding them what the Lord's Supper is all about. He says, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Take seriously this time. Don't just view it as cookies and juice. View it as an opportunity to recommit your life to Jesus or maybe commit your life to him for the first time. And by taking the bread, taking of the, the juice, Make it a statement to God and to each other that you are taking Christ into your life and committing yourself to him. So whether you're here or whether you're at home, let this be a sacred time, sacred time of commitment to you. If the deacons would stand, please. Jesus took the bread. And he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He also took the cup. And this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. And he passed it among his friends.
and said, drink from it, all of you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for your love, your sacrifice, for sending your son to die on the cross that we may receive forgiveness of sin. God, as we celebrate this Lord's Supper, as we go through this routine, God, it's been more to us than just a ritual, a routine. God, this has been our commitment to you. We ask, God, that you would receive our commitment, that you would give us an extra dose of your blessing today as a result of our recommitting our lives to you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask the, uh, the praise team if they'd come forward and lead us in our, our closing song. And as they come, let's stand together. that you are all spiritually that we need today and we thank you for being there never leaving us or forsaking us thank you for the hope you give us now God as we leave this place I pray your blessings on each of us may you bless us and protect us may you cause your face to shine upon us and be gracious to you Lord may you give us your love and your peace now God help us to go in your peace in the name of Jesus I pray amen thank you and may God bless Thank you.